The purpose of this video is to provide an insight into the fire risk assessment process whether carried out by the local authority, a specialist contractor or yourself. It also covers the kinds of control measures which may be required. Several guidance documents are referred to in this video which are available to view on the NLA online library. We will demonstrate how to access that at the end of the video. The Housing Act 2004 introduced the Housing Health and Safety Rating System known as HHSRS, where fire is specifically recognised as a hazard which can be rated. It is therefore no surprise that property available to let must provide an adequate means of warning and escape in case of fire. The required measures will depend upon the size of the property and whether it is in single or multiple occupation. This may require the installation of a specified level of automatic fire detection, provision of extinguishing equipment and in some cases fire doors. In order to determine what measures would be required in a particular dwelling, a risk assessment should be carried out. The local authority will sometimes do one for you. Since the introduction of the Regulatory Reform Fire Safety Order 2005, landlords of some types of houses in multiple occupation must conduct a fire risk assessment for the shared parts of a premise. Assessments can be undertaken by the landlord or specialist companies and are enforced by the fire authority. This covers the common areas of a residential property and works may be required to minimise any risks identified. Although the two pieces of legislation mentioned overlap, which at times can be confusing, essentially the safety measures undertaken should satisfy both the local authority and the fire authority. They should have established an effective working arrangement so it is clear which authority will take the lead in which types of property. Check with both locally before starting work. A fire risk assessment and the associated guidance enables a landlord to adopt a methodical approach to assessing their premises in order to identify what fire hazards exist, risks to occupants and visitors, and what can be done to mitigate and control these risks. For most rental properties, the risk assessment will be relatively simple, with little prior fire safety experience required by the landlord. Local government regulation, formerly LACORS, have produced guidance which should provide enough information to do this and can be found on the NLA online library. If you don't feel confident carrying out a risk assessment yourself or the building is a block of flats, larger HMO or houses people who may particularly be at risk such as the elderly or infirm then you can employ a suitably qualified or experienced person to carry out the assessment on your behalf. It is the landlord as the responsible person who remains responsible for the outcome. Substantial fines and even imprisonment have been given to landlords who fail to carry out a suitable risk assessment and then had a fire. In Scotland, fire precautions and means of escape are covered under the Scottish Repairing Standard, which states that it should be ensured that the house has satisfactory provision for detecting fires and for giving warning in the event of fire or suspected fire. A risk assessment for fire safety should include both the likelihood of a fire starting and, once started, how likely the fire is to go undetected and spread. This will encompass identifying fire hazards and people at risk. In other words, you will need to determine what fire safety measures and control measures are necessary to ensure the safety of people in the building should a fire occur by reducing the probability of a fire starting limiting the effects should a fire occur and ensuring that all occupants are alerted and can leave the premises safely in the event of a fire. The record should indicate the date the assessment was made, the hazards identified, any people especially at risk, what action has been and still needs to be taken and by when, and the conclusions arising from the assessment. The NLA has produced a very useful fire safety logbook which can help you keep records in one document. As well as a pro forma for the risk assessment, the logbook also details how often different items should be checked 
and whether by the owner or manager, or whether an engineer is required. Your fire safety risk assessment is not a one-off procedure and should be regularly reviewed. The behaviour of tenants is a major factor in relation to fires starting and their reactions on discovering a fire can influence their likelihood of escape and how the fire might spread. Smoke as materials and matches are a common cause of fire along with misuse or carelessness when cooking or placing items on or too near heaters. So, examples of what to consider when looking at how fires start could be heaters or cookers. Are they appropriately sited, not near to flammable materials and in good working order? Is the heating adequate for the whole of the dwelling, which will reduce the requirement for additional heaters, which may be defective or dangerously sited by tenants? Are there sufficient facilities for drying clothes? Drying on heaters can cause overheating. Are there sufficient and appropriately sited electrical sockets? Tenants often have many electrical items and may overload sockets if there aren't enough outlets. Is the electrical installation in good order? Defects to the supply, meters, fuses, wiring, sockets or switches can all cause problems. Residual current devices, known as RCDs, help prevent fires associated with electrical devices as well as reducing electric shocks. Are there any open or solid fuel fires? Do they have suitable guards? Examples of what to consider when looking at the severity of the outcome include Are there any combustible furnishings and furniture which would allow the fire to spread? Is there disrepair to walls, ceilings or floors which would allow fire, smoke and fumes to spread? And don't forget hidden areas. In many buildings, cables and pipes will have to pass through walls and partitions, often within ceiling voids. These will also need to be correctly sealed to stop the spread of fire from one part of a building to another. Are there smoke and heat detectors and are they working correctly and suitably sited? Is there an alarm system and is it working properly? Are internal doors fire doors where necessary? Are they well fitted and do they have self-closers to ensure they are kept shut? Is the means of escape adequate and the escape route free from clutter? and any items that could hinder people trying to escape. Is there any firefighting equipment and is it suitable? What system to fit will depend on the size and occupancy of the house and the findings of any risk assessment completed. British standards publish codes of practice on the design, installation and maintenance of different types of detection and alarm systems which enforcers will often refer to when specifying grades and categories to be met. System grades relate to the engineering aspects of the system and run from A to F. Grades A to C are the most comprehensive systems and have central control equipment by way of a fire panel. These will often be found in larger houses in multiple occupation. Grade D systems have one or more mains powered, smoke or heat alarms, each with an integral standby supply. Grade E systems have one or more mains powered smoke or heat alarms with no standby supply. Grade F systems have one or more smoke or heat alarms and are battery powered only. Categories depend on the objectives that the system is designed to meet. Category M, meaning manual, incorporates no automatic detection. Category L means life protection and category P means property protection. From a regulatory point of view, Category L systems are therefore needed in dwellings and this is further denoted by a D for dwelling, then subdivided depending on the coverage of the system. For example, LD1 would cover all areas of the building, whilst LD3 covers escape routes only. It should be noted that in Scotland any alarms installed or replaced on or after the 3rd of September 2007 must be mains powered. There are no circumstances where no alarm in a home is acceptable or should be considered as being acceptable. Whilst the main message should be the provision of a well protected property which not only enables occupants to escape quickly and safely, a primary means of firefighting equipment such as fire blankets and extinguishers could also be provided. It's extremely important 
that tenants are thoroughly briefed about the system when they take a tenancy or if the system is changed. Some landlords include information attached to the tenancy agreement and get a signature that it has been explained. Additionally, it's good practice to display a clear sign informing tenants what to do in the event of a fire and again the NLA logbook has an example you can use. So, whether you are required to carry out a risk assessment yourself or not, you'll always be required to ensure that your property has adequate fire precautions and means of escape and that all systems and equipment are maintained in good working order. We hope this video has given you an insight into what may be required and helped you understand what is involved. Further information and guidance documents can be found on the NLA online library and now we'll show you how to access that.